Good afternoon, Heart Change Fellowship. How are you guys doing today? Good, good, good to hear. Today we're going to be talking about something that I think we talk about a lot in our, in our society, but I don't think we've ever talked about it in this kind of context when it comes to Christianity. We're going to be talking about distractions. Now we're like, oh, like we talk about it when we're driving, like texting and driving. That's a distraction. That's a notable distraction. But when it comes to Christ, it's a little, a little more subtle sometimes what a distraction can be. What, what can stop you from looking or directing yourself towards Christ? So the question today is, what are you looking at? So let me give you a quick history lesson on something I found interesting when I was thinking about the subject. Uh, when horses and buggies were a common mode of transportation, horses wore blinders. You even see it sometimes when you see a horse um, on one of those like, little romantic horse rides around. Actually, they're not that romantic if you ever go on one because horses are really dirty from being in the city, and then you look at that, but that's another subject. But when, when you, you notice that on the side of the eyes, you see like a little, a little leather um, pad on the side of a horse's eye when it's walking, and that's called a blinder. That started, a preacher had a bet that his horse could walk up the stairs in his home. He won the bet. The horse did it with no problem, walked up the stairs, but the horse refused to come back down, all the pulling and the dragging. So the preacher figured out he put a cloth over the horse's head, and then he was able to lead the horse back down the stairs. All the horse's fear went away, and he trusted his master on where to go. And then horses sometimes need to be made to focus, and from that discovery, the preacher found out that if you put a little, the horse will look straight. Now, horses have eyes on the side of their head because they were hunted in nature. So over time, they developed eyes on the side of their head so they could see prey coming and quickly run, because we all know horses are fast. But that eyes on the side of their head, that natural thing they have, can get them easily distracted. They can't go forward sometimes. They can't, they'll get scared on going straight because they'll see something unfamiliar. But you put that little blinder on the side, they're focused on the task at hand. Every racehorse goes with blinders because if the racehorse didn't have the blinders, he would go off to the left, he would go off to the right, he would crash, he wouldn't listen to the commands given. But once that little bit of sight is focused forward, the horse gives over all trust to the master. It's kind of a I thought that was very interesting when I did that research on that. So let's pray real quick before we start. Lord, uh, I just want to ask you right now as we come before you just to take away all distractions so that we can listen to this message with expectation so that your Holy Spirit can come in and direct us and point us forward, put blinders where we need them in life, Lord, so that we can do great things for you. In your holy and precious name, Jesus, amen. So let's come to the scripture. We're at Matthew 19, 16 through 22. It'll be up on the screen. The rich young ruler. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Let's pause there. The young ruler realized something. He realized he was lacking he realized there was something. He wasn't meeting the mark. He was keeping all the commandments, he said. And remember his question, what shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? So sometimes in our own lives, we have to do that. We have to come to Jesus like, what am I lacking? You ever seen someone who... um, who is battling on whether to turn their life over fully to Christ. And sometimes they feel like, I feel like there's a hole in me. I feel really depressed. I feel all these types of things. And you're, what, they're, what they're coming to terms with is the Holy Spirit realize, and help them realize that they're lacking something. So this young ruler, let's talk about this young ruler. The word translated ruler in Greek is actually archon, generally one who has administrative authority, a leader official, It is used for Jewish leaders, including those in charge of the synagogue and members of the Sanhedrin. So he had status. He was popular already. He had that. Other people looked up to him. Other people would probably go and ask him for advice on situations. Luke 18.23 tells us he was a man of great wealth. Wealth in Greek is plesoros, pertaining to having an abundance of earthly possessions. 
that exceeds the normal experience. So we're talking about a rich young man right here. We're talking about someone who he was probably dressed very well when he came to Jesus. So the adjective great translates the Greek's fedora, a very high point on a scale of extent, very much extremely great. So these words were specifically chosen to describe this ruler. The rich young ruler is a, an incredibly rich person. So would you describe him as someone who is lacking? When you look at him, you wouldn't describe him as someone who's lacking, well-dressed, always has money, not on the street cursing people out, very peaceful, a leader in the church. You would say, this person lacks nothing. But instead, he came to that term. He came to that on himself. Not like someone else came to him and said, hey, man, you're lacking something. He came to that term. So take this image of a rich young man, a founder of Facebook, a Tom Brady, a Drake. He comes to Jesus, well-dressed, easily recognizable, others watching, and think about this from Jesus' perspective. If Jesus takes him as a disciple, this would draw others in. They'd be like, oh, that, that guy, he saw a worth in Jesus. Maybe I could see a worth in Jesus. And then they're starting to, fo- what, are they really focusing on Jesus? Could his wealth and other things could be a distraction, him at the church? That's another thing to think about. They would follow the path of the rich young ruler. The ruler's personal servant is probably standing and watching. The pressure is on. As you see right there, he's probably in front of Jesus, like, what am I lacking? Who's ever done that in yourself? Who's ever got on your own knees and got in front of the Lord and said, like, what am I lacking? The, this is modern Christians. We come to Christ, correction, Christ calls us, and we look at him. We tell him, I tithe, I serve at church, I'm faithful to my spouse, I pray, what do I lack? Then Jesus does something. Jesus points at our idols, the things we yearn for, the things we want the most, control, security, money, spouses, health, status, jewels, excitement, he points to those things. And then let's see what happens here when Jesus does that to the rich young ruler. We're in verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. So we come to the terms of the idol worship. I like that picture of Jesus next to the Corvette. That's gonna be like the young ruler. He coming up, he's like, he pulls up next to Jesus. He's like, yo, what, do I, what am I lacking? And Jesus is like, give up the car. He's like, Aah. you know, he goes to the, um, <laughs> he's like, absolutely not. This is, this is how I value myself. It's what Noel was talking about. Jesus plus this, Jesus plus this. I'm doing all these things already. I already, I'm already giving you all that I've given you, Lord. Could you, I have a reaction probably of, you go to the next one. These are all the things that Jesus is pointing at. Control, control, money. Keep going. You can keep going, fly through it. Spouses, health, all the things we hold on to. Uh, status, I'm better than you. He had all that. He could say that easily to people. You know, the jewels, he probably had a lot of jewelry. You know, the excitement, think about that for one moment. That can be something that people really hold on to. People get thrilled when they're around me. People are excited when we're around me. I can find my own excitement when I'm out there. I can make the party better. I bring these things to it. That could be a distraction too. And then we go to the scripture. This is how, this is how I imagine his reaction when Jesus told him that. So you go to the next one. So this is what Jesus asked him to do. Take off your chain, throw it away, put on the cross, and then, don't ask me that. <laughs> he was done. He was done. Like, he, think about it. He came through. He suffered all that. And Jesus asked him one thing. He's like, no, don't ask me that. That's the one thing Jesus said, to sell all your possessions and come follow me. Then he, remember what Jesus, he asked, said, what am I lacking? You'll lack nothing. But what did he do? He walked away. All right. It is not Jesus that walks away from us but we who distractedly walk away from him. I got that from Andy Larson. He gave me some help on this. So here we're going to talk about how to avoid distractions, how to ensure that you are not being slowly led in another direction by distractions. In other words, how to put on spiritual blinders on the side of your head or in your mind or in your heart, how to put on those blinders, how to say, like, I'm not going to allow these things to take me to the right, take me to the left. I'm going to go down those stairs when God commands me. I'm not going to stay up there and be scared and not do those things. 
Because if you think about it, the rich young ruler walked away because he was scared. He was scared. What if I really do give up everything that I value? Because isn't that what God asks us to do? Nail ourselves to the cross? Deny ourselves? And that's basically what he asked. And you also have to remember, Jesus knows our sins. When the rich young ruler walked over, he knew the sins already, just like the woman at the well, just like he knew what was holding back Nicodemus, the same thing. A couple of things to think about. One, God is the perfect judge. He knows everything. When the young ruler walked up to Jesus, he knew the young ruler's idols, just like the woman at the well. There is no knowledge God lacks. So when he commands you to let go of something, he knows why you should let it go. Because you have to remember later on in the scripture, he also said it's harder, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Because he sees like he's not lacking. He doesn't see the purpose of me giving all this up. You kind of ask yourself that question, why would God give this all to me for me to give it up? And then two, he knows the motivation of all your action. He knows why you're coming to church. He knows why you're talking to that person of the opposite sex. He knows why you wore that outfit. He knows why you said those words. He knows why you didn't even speak the words you didn't say, why you were silent in certain situations. So these are all the things you have to think about when you're coming up against distractions, when you're coming up how you interact with people. And then three, the Lord understands everything you're going through, everything. That came to me one time. My wife and I were in the car praying, and she was like, I just feel blah, like just blah. Like I don't even want to go to work right now. I feel like if they came in and fired me, I would say, okay, and just walk out. And everyone has felt like that at work. If you haven't, uh, you're either... No, you're a liar. That's all there is to it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's no other way to explain it. But that is, that's the only way to say it. Like, everyone has felt like that. And we, I was like, let's pray through it. Let's talk to God. And I thought about it like, wait a minute, he's our high priest. He's gone through this. Let's remember, Jesus had a job. I shared this with some people early, uh, a couple months ago. Jesus had a job. He was a carpenter. Jesus had to go to work. Jesus had to shave down. And carpenter is not like easy work. He had to build tables and chairs. Probably like, if I build one more chair, man, I'm a, <laughs> you know, like he had to build chair. He had to pay taxes. Think about it. His money would come in and then some guy who he knows is ripping him off would ask him for at least 60% of his salary. Oh, you made 400 this week. Thank you for 300. And I'll move on from this. And if you don't give me, the Romans will come and kill you. Like he went through all that. He was cheated. He was probably lied on. We see this in the own scripture. That We see this all in scripture. All these things Jesus went through. Jesus went through the monotony of life. He even went to the point where he was explaining himself over and over. Yes, I'm God. Yes, I'm God. Yes, I'm God. How many times am I going to tell you this? Yes, I'm God. <laughs> like, you know, like all these times he went through everything we went through. So when we're going through distractions, when we're going to work and it's hard for us to focus and pray, when we're going through all these things and you're like, man, I don't even want to bring this to God. God felt all these emotions. He was tempted to stray. He was tempted to be distracted. He was tempted. So that's all these things when you really think about it. It's culminated in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. I have it up. Oh, you can go back one. I'm, we're going to talk about sneaky distractions. See, the guy was at, focused on the water and then got hit by the cat in the back of the head. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so like, we're going to talk about sneaky distractions. But let's talk about Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confessions, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So when I was thinking about this, I was like, I could talk about our idols, but we hear a lot about idols. And we hear a lot about, and I can direct you to a lot of things on Tim Keller and everything about idols. But it made me think about the sneaky distractions, the ones that are not easily seen or discovered. It's like the small splinter in your finger that you don't notice that later becomes infected and then causes a huge sickness of your entire body. I could talk about the rich young ruler was born into money. He probably never noticed how an idol formed in his heart. He had so much that he realized that he was lacking, and when God asked him to give it up, he couldn't. Think about it, that, that little bit of money could have been a distraction forever, not a little bit, a lot of bit of money that he was born into. He could feel like, I deserve this, this is something that it was, you know, I have, I keep it, I still have to keep it in check, and I still have to pay taxes, and make sure I don't lose it all. And he's like, so why would I give this up? 
He never saw that little bit of distraction turn into an idol and then a stronghold. Think about it. God, he, he came to him because he knew it was lacking. He knew he was talking to God. And he said, and God was like, give it up and follow me. He's like, no, and just walked off. Think about that. A sneaky distraction that we don't think about a lot is boredom or feeling blah. Just a sinking and complacent feeling. We can start to look and focus on the emotion or the feeling, then try to remedy it through the things of this world. So we look at boredom, right? And we think that that can't really be a distraction. How's that a distraction? Yeah, because when it's time to sit down and pray, or when it's time to do something like, I'm bored, I'm this, ah, my job, I'm praying and my job is still boring. My job hasn't changed. So you start focusing on the boredom instead of on Christ. You start focusing on that emotion and that feeling, that blah, that harassment, that this, that that, and you don't focus on it at all. You don't focus on God at all. Instead of saying, let me pray, you say like, I'm gonna go on a vacation. I'm gonna go run around and uh, I'm gonna go out with my friends. I'm gonna get some Kool-Aid outside with my friends and go crazy. That's from Andy last week. I thought that was hilarious when he kept saying it. I'm going to do those types of things. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start disregarding my responsibilities because I need to liven up my life. I'm going to start dressing different, dyeing my hair, all these other things to try to get this boredom away. But the actual remedy is in the Word of God. If you go to Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 26, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment, for to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give one who pleases God. This is also vanity and striving after the wind. What, what Solomon is trying to communicate here is the fact that you have a job is a blessing from God, one. The fact that you can go home and buy food is a blessing from God, two. And the fact that you're doing it and you have knowledge of God is a blessing because your actions are no longer in vain because you're doing it for God. Because everyone else who is not a believer, everyone else who's not elect, everyone else who does, has not responded to the Holy Spirit literally just goes to work for no reason. But you have a purpose. You are at work to serve God. You are at work to let your light shine. You are at work. So no matter how boring it is, liven it up. Start talking to someone about Christ. Hey, Christ is a rebel. Get in there. Get, and trust me, people start coming to you for advice. People will start looking at you like, oh, I know that person's peaceful. I know that person strives. I know that person's very thoughtful. I know that person on my birthday remembered it and walked up and said, man, I love you on your birthday. I don't even know you that well. I love you, man. You can come talk to me anytime. That person invited me to his house. You start a ministry because you're literally at work for ministry. You're not there to gather and collecting. That doesn't mean you don't show up on time. That doesn't mean you don't do what you're supposed to be doing. But you're not there just to do that. Now, everyone else is, but you as, as, a chosen, as, a, as a person chosen by the creator of the world, you are there to minister. And so, therefore, you are no longer bored. If you're bored, that's exactly what my wife did. She's like, I'm bored. I have Muslim people at work. I'm going to start researching on Islam, understand it better. We even read a book together this summer, and I'm going to start ministering to them. And the boredom is gone. She starts talking to other people. They're in the car with her, listening to music, crying and telling her problems, calling her for prayer, all these things. Boom. The boredom, the blondness is gone. It's defeated by the Holy Spirit. That's it. So, so we have the boredom gone because we're focusing on what? Christ. We're no longer looking at why am I here? I'm no longer looking at the laptop, the chair, the cubicle, or for some of us, the kids and the teacher, the principal, my boss is annoying me, whatever. You're just a distraction from why God put me here. Another distraction, friendship. <laughs> Let's do this and that. Let's go to the park. Let's drink some more Kool-Aid. <laughs> so you're in a friendship relationship you're never praying not holding each other accountable because you are scared to lose the friendship you're scared the other friend will think it was boring you don't want to talk about scripture and things because that'll get too deep sometimes you have a backsliding friend you're like eh, I'm not going to engage that or you have a friend that God told you a long time ago to cut off that's dragging you down but you refuse to do it Friends could be an easy distraction. Christian friends, other friends. Because you have friends that come to church, and when you get together, don't want to talk about God at all. Not at all. You, you could have friends that aren't praying for you, or friends that aren't encouraging you to pray, friends that aren't encouraging you. Then we all have unsaved friends, because I, I unless you live, or you're Amish, but you all have unsaved friends of some sort. And are you letting them drag you down? Is that a distraction? Are you too, you don't want to talk about God 
They ask you how you make a decision. You're like, oh, you know, I, I think about it. You don't say, I pray. I ask my pastor. You don't let them in on that little bit of insight because you're scared to offend them. That's a distraction. Because right now, your blindness just went away and you start thinking about all that doubt. You start thinking about all those things. You start thinking about them judging you. And then your status comes into play and then all this. Instead of saying, I'm just going to be upfront about who I am. If someone asks me why I'm special, because I'm loved by the creator of the world, and I understand that, and my eyes are open to that knowledge. And then you're like, what is that about? You tell them, like, oh, and then, you know, like, a personal side, someone might say, oh, so you hate gays? No, no, I don't. And if I hate someone, then that wouldn't make any sense, because Jesus loves everybody. Or you might say, like, oh, you don't like Muslims? That doesn't make any sense. We were all enemies of God once. I'm just happy that I'm no longer one. So, like, you have all that, you have all that confidence, and then the blinders are back up, and you know why you have friendships. Now, you can have friendships to love, and to show grace and receive grace. And then sometimes you have to show your friends way more grace than they're giving you at certain times. But that's the point of friendship. So it's no longer a distraction because you're putting, it, you're putting God first and therefore you can view the friendship correctly. Your friends, I'm not going with you to the bar every night. That is not what I'll do. Maybe after work, I'll go and I'll get one drink and I'll go home. You know, that's about it. I'm not going to let this eat up my time. I'm not going to let this distract me from what I need to do. I'm going to encourage my other Christian friends. Let's pray together. Pray for me. I need, your t- I need this. Share a testimony about what's going on. So then your friends are no longer a distraction because you put the right thing in first. You seek God first. And then a scripture on that, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. And then Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Think about that. Your job in a friendship is to build that other person up. That's your job in this friendship. Now, this one is a little more apparent, but let's take a different perspective on it. The next distraction, social media. This is where you put your time and energy. You also hide behind the Internet and say mean things or judge people and gossip about them. You stalk people, you look up exes, you watch the same videos, you spend your precious time not praying and seeking. There was a pastor here about a couple months ago. He said he has to put his phone in the other room when he wants to pray. That makes perfect sense. Because <laughs> it is distracting. I don't know, they always have a funny video of something that you want to see or some gymnastic person flipping or someone running really fast or some, a bus driver throwing ice on people. There's, there's always something that you could see and can easily distract you. I'm not saying like there's some people say, I'm not going to start a Facebook account. I'm just going to be out. There's benefits to having a Facebook account. I was telling people that I haven't seen in five or six years that came into town. Man, I'm glad I get to keep up with your life through this. We can talk. We can discuss things. We are um, relevant to us, um, social issues on Twitter. I follow a bunch of people and get thoughts and things from that. Um, Tim Keller encourages me. Bizzle encourages me. Other people encourage me through social media. But then I have to put it to that guys of God first. Like, oh, what is my purpose on social media? Why am I on there? How, is it, how can I bring glory to God through this? Oh, I can encourage people. I see someone go, I, I've done it several times. You see someone like post something crazy. You message them and like, yo, is everything okay? I'll pray with you. And he's like, man, no one's even reached out to me in my own home or in my own neighborhood. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Just knowing you can use it as ministry. You can use it to edify God. You can use it to edify yourself and other believers. You can use it to spread word about heart change. You could use it to spread word about a, a charity or a cause that you're doing. Or you hear someone is, um, needs to talk to someone, a therapist, you can say, I know somebody. Here's Lila's Facebook page. Message her, and she can come and talk to her. Sorry I called you out, but I, it came to my mind. But these are things you can do with your social media. Now, you can also do what I mentioned before, stalk people, look up people, watch videos, but that's really just a distraction, and you're not going to do those things. Now, I'm not saying like relaxing or watching a video every once in a while is a bad thing, but that's all you're doing. You should really say this is a distraction. And we all know we have limited time, and we all know we wait to the end of the day to start reading our Bible, what's going to happen? We're going to be sleep right on it. So like, you have to really manage your time when it comes to those things. So a remedy to that, Ephesians 5, 16. Make the best use of time because the days are evil. I mean, I think that sums up. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So we have to really think about that when it comes to social media, when it comes to Twitter. Especially, I have to talk personally, I have to stop watching Twitter sometimes because it'll make me so angry what people say and the illogical or things they say, like, you know, this Trump. I just exit out and don't watch it. Ben Carson do the same thing. I just, I just let those things go. Like, so you have to also think about that. <laughs> Here's another one. I thought about this because I'm a new father. Children. 
It's another sneaky distraction. You spend energy and time focusing on them. But when they're not at home or they're sleeping, instead of reading and praying or fasting, or you say you, you, say you need time for yourself, you use your children as your excuse. This is true, but you also need time for the source of wisdom, source of love and patience. You need to carve out the time with Jesus. If not when they're not home or if not when they're sleeping, then when? You say things like, I can't fast, it's too hard. I have to feed the kids. I can't look at the macaroni and cheese they're giving them and then not fast. Well, there's other things you can fast. You can fast social media. You can fast when you go to work. I'm not gonna eat breakfast and lunch. When I get home, I make the mac and cheese, I'm gonna enjoy it with them, right? You can do those things. When they're playing at the park, you can pray for a moment. Your eyes don't have to be closed to pray. If they woke up at 3 a.m., spend some time praying before you go back to sleep. Read a scripture. My wife does that, and I usually end up going to the couch to get her because she fell asleep, but she's doing it. Like she's right on her Bible. She tried. She read a couple scriptures. <laughs> but she does it. She said, I'm going to do it. If my son's going to wake me up and give him a bottle and I can be able to fall asleep for 30 minutes, I'm going to pray. You hear her out there walking around, talking to the God, praising him. My wife has another relationship with God altogether. But that's it. And I go out there, I'm like, mm-hmm, honey. I'm right in. <laughs> and that's it. But you're trying. You're trying to carve out that time because you have to realize how important it is. But you wouldn't think of your children as a distraction. You're like, that's a good thing. I should pour my energy into them. But you still have to carve out that time. If they're on the field playing while you're watching their game, you can pray for five minutes during the timeout. You can pray for five minutes while they're doing it. It's a scripture for that. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God, the Father through him. In Philippians 4.13, because this is important, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You can endure this. You can endure the tiredness because he gives you strength. You can endure the lack of, of just sleep and time to think about yourself because you have a child and a spouse and other things because he gives you strength. He promised you that. So you can do that. You can build up that com- You can build that up. He'll give you the strength of the day. He can give you extra caffeine in your coffee. <laughs> so... Now we're coming to the next distraction, the danger zone. This one I thought about. I didn't even get this one. I was talking to my wife about, the, about, the, um, about me preaching, and she gave me this one. So you can go to the danger zone. Hold on. See? He thought that sign, boom, he fell in. <laughs> a sinkhole. See, you don't trust the sign. This is a danger zone. Excuses. Excuses. Now, you wouldn't think of this as a distraction. You'd be like, you just make excuses. But that's not true. My wife gave me this one. This one is worse because you just pile up distractions in your face. The excuses actually prove to yourself that you're not focused on God. It's hard to make excuses when you're face to face with the master of the universe. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve tried to make excuses. It didn't work. It's this woman, God. Really, I gave you, I told you not to go to the tree. But no, the serpent tricked me. I told you not to go to the tree. I always say personally, I would have cut down the tree. Unless God told me not to, I'd have ripped it out of the ground, I'd have burned it. I was like, what? why am I? <laughs> There's no temptation here. I don't want anyone. But, <laughs> but when you think about it, these excuses are things that you build up. It's funny. You can't make them in front of God. The rich young ruler didn't even try. He just, he left. He was like, ah, and just walked off. He was like, I'm not giving it up. There's nothing. You couldn't even say, this is my family. This is my family money. My family needs it. No, no, no. He just walked off. Let's visit some common excuses we have all made and then talk about what you're really saying. I will read later. Oh, the blue didn't come out, so I'll read it out to you. I will read later. I am too tired to read my Bible. I prayed earlier. I just need to relax. I have been at work all day. These are all that I've said them. And if someone told me they didn't say them, I kind of don't believe you. I know I don't believe you at all. <laughs> And, well, what you're really saying is the same thing for all of them, which is, you can, I would rather do what I want to do. That's exactly what you're saying. I'm tired. But you didn't go to sleep. You went and watched TV. You went and played a game. You went on Facebook, you know? Like, you didn't do that. So, like, it makes no sense. I'm too, t- I'm too tired to read my Bible. I prayed earlier. You could pray again. Like, what are they? the Bible is no, like, prescribed pray once, you know? <laughs> I just need to relax. What better time is to relax with God? It doesn't have to be like this intense moment where you're like sweating and you're like in a hole or in a ditch or in a prayer room, like on the floor. You can literally just be like, you know, I'm God, I'm just going to listen to you for a couple minutes. 
I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to take a scripture that's touched my heart before and I'm going to meditate on it. Literally just, I'm going to repeat it, I'm going to write down a card, and I'm going to just sit back and relax and let you talk to me, you know? Or if you need to be active, like, I, when, when I used to ride my bike, God would talk to me all the time. And I felt like that was a moment when I could just zone out and just listen to him. If that's what you need to do. But the Bible really says pray without ceasing. Like, the, and remember what you're saying when you're telling God, I don't have time for you right now, or I'm not in the mood. What you're really saying is, I want to do what I want to do. Like, and what you're really building is a habit of rebellion. You're starting down a path that is dangerous. Your true, distra- your true distraction is entertainment and pleasing yourself. You want to be entertained. You want God to make himself interesting to you. You want God to make you want him. You are focused on you and you alone, how you feel. God's never said, serve me when you feel like it. Serve me when it's not too hard. Serve me when you're at 100% energy, because he knows that it never exists. That doesn't exist. There's no moment when you're going to be at 100% energy. If you are, you're, you're probably the rich young ruler. You're just very rich, and you have a lot of time to do what you want to do. Some scripture on that, Hosea 10, 12. I think this is, a, when I looked up scriptures, I thought this was very important to how to get this out, how to root this at its, at its core. Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. When you're seeking God, you're literally breaking down rebellion. You're breaking down your fleshly desires. You'll see the foolishness in some of the things that you do. You'll see how useless it is, how useless it is to get angry about certain things. God will come in and break up that ground. And, all, and a, a quote from Matthew Henry, In eating and drinking and all we do, we should aim at the glory of God, at pleasing and honoring him. This is the great end of all religion and directs us where express rules are wanting. You see what I'm saying? You're trying to live by rules like the young ruler, but that doesn't work. Because then you're, are you pleasing God or are you just following rules? Why are you doing it? Remember, we, we talked about this before, God is the perfect judge. God knows all your motivation, and God's been there already. And I know what you're really saying. I was on earth too. Like, I know what you're really saying when you say that. Like, I've been tired. I've gone home from work. Like, you have the ability to do these things. I wanted to talk about something. I was, I, I was reading an article about, it's called... Alchemy. You ever heard of alchemy? It's where you're trying to turn. Uh, I, I find that one of the a famous alchemists we've all heard of is um, the wizard from King Arthur. What, his name escapes me. Right? Merlin. Yes, Merlin was an alchemist. You're trying to turn a metal into gold. So you're trying to take a regular metal that you can find anywhere and turn it into a precious substance. Now, alchemy is a process. No one has done it. However, some of the greatest scientists in the world have ha- have tried their hand at alchemy. Isaac Newton was an alchemist. He invented calculus, and he is the father of modern physics. He dabbled in the practice of alchemy early on in his life, but he would not be remembered if he had continued that pursuit. If he had let the desire to make gold distract him, would he have invented calculus? Would he be the father of modern physics? Would all these things happen? No, he'd have spent his time trying to what? Like make money, I'm be rich, if I, I'm so close, I'm almost there, I'm almost there to make, make this metal into gold. However, the only alchemist is Jesus. He can take us and breathe life into us and refine us into pure gold if we focus on him. God is the only alchemist. He's the only one who can take us and transform us into, into gold, into something worthwhile. And just into, he breathes value into us. Remember we talked about this earlier, when other people who are not saved go to work, they literally just go to work to sow and to grow and to just do these things just for earth. When we go to work, we literally serve the master of the universe. That's, that's, that's God's alchemy. That's God's process. That's God taking us through and transforming us, putting us in the fire and forming us and breaking off things. That is that process. That is the process. So God is the only alchemist. You can go to the next one. You can go to the next one. So I have a couple questions to ask yourself. Am I bringing God glory in my actions? So every time you're about to jump on Facebook, every time you're about to go to work, every time you're about to interact with somebody, ask yourself that question. Number two, do I find myself making a lot of excuses? Because I realized something. I went through a a lot this summer. I'll pause here. Um, (laughs) I was unemployed for about 72 hours. And... um, 
and went through a lot of my own fault, like of not getting my license together, and then I thought I was going to get another job, but no one told me that they weren't going to give me the job. They acted like they were going to give me the job, and they basically said, you have the job. But then right before, you know, like, and, and I'm a teacher, so there's a season of when there is time to get jobs, and there's a season when you're out of it. And so in the midst of the season when you're out to get jobs, someone called me and was like, oh, we for, you know, we meant to call you, we saw that you were emailing, but we didn't call you, and all these things, and we're like, oh, so like I'm without a job. And I realized like they were making, like he was making a lot of excuses, and I was like, why am I getting angry? I didn't get angry about it, because one, I didn't, I, I've tried not to get angry about the things, so then God just makes me look foolish. Because then he just works it out and he had this plan he knew it was coming already. And then so I just tried to stay calm. But then I thought about it. When you start justifying your actions, you're probably doing some pretty horrible things. When you start putting like, oh, I'm doing this because of this. Or oh, it's okay that I'm doing this because this person did this. I can gossip about that person because it's true. Or I can lie because I don't want to suffer the consequences. And it's better that they don't know the truth. Um, I could take this little thing here because no one's going to miss it. That starts building up these, these horrible actions that you're doing and your justifications become biz, bigger and bigger and mount up. But the end of the story, God worked it out. I literally applied for a job Monday, got called Monday, got in the interview Tuesday, and then got the job Tuesday. So I literally just went the weekend you know, without a job, and then I was jobbed in. And then God has just been slowly just, I can go through hours and hours of just what God has been doing as I've gone to this new school. And even a guy I led to Christ a couple of years ago, I lost him. I couldn't even find him. I tried to call him, and I went out to, because we have no cell service in our um, building, so I walked out to the edge of the lawn so I could send some text messages, and I'm sitting there, and I see a guy drive by on tinted windows, and I look at him, I was like, is that him? He comes back out, that's him. I haven't found him in two years I've been looking for him. And we reconnected there, exchanged numbers, and he's been talking about everything that God's been doing. So, like, God literally, when he wants you on the right path, shows you a lot of things. So, number three, if God came and found me where I am right now, would he be pleased, or would I have a lot of excuses? Oh, I, I was thinking about this, God. I didn't get a chance to do this. Like, God is continually in the Bible trying to tell us to not get distracted and to not make these excuses. Do not worry about what, where you should eat or where you shall drink. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue jobs or do them well, but I have places for you because you're my child. I have a job for you. I have a ministry for you. Not that you have to go and start your own church, but I'm gonna put you somewhere where you could benefit and where people will benefit from me through you. I'm gonna put you somewhere to do that. Like sometimes you look and you say, is this job really for me? Doesn't matter, because you're doing it for God. You're going to impact people with your calmness, with your wisdom that God will give you, and all those things. And same thing in friendship, same thing on social media, same thing through a lot of things. You can make a lot of distractions. And I'll talk about one last one, a big one that I didn't put up, but I thought of on the way to church. The what if distraction. What if I had done this differently? What if I had done this differently? What if I had said that? What if I had saved money five years ago? What if I had did this? What if I had did this? Oh, what if I hadn't done this? It doesn't matter. God used everything for a good. God can make everything good for those who love him. So that, that distraction is gone. I'm putting it all on God. I didn't do it. God knew I wouldn't do it, and God knew if I did do it, what would happen, and God knew when I didn't do it, what would happen. And he had a, a path and a plan. Every redeemer has a plan, and we serve the greatest redeemer. So he's redeeming us, and he has a plan for us. That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>